draw the whole creation to yourself, that your salvation may be known through all the earth. The grace of God be with us all. O Christ, Savior and Lord, extend your church to every place. Make it a place of welcome for people of every race and tongue. The grace of God be with us all. O Christ, ruler of rulers, direct the works and thoughts of the leaders of nations that we may seek justice and further peace and freedom for all. The grace of God be with us all. O Christ, Master of all, support all the weak and comfort the afflicted. Strengthen the tempted and raise the fallen. Watch over the lonely and those in danger. Give hope to the despairing and sustain the faith of the persecuted. Praise God be with us all. Amen. O Christ, light made man manifest in the true light of God, gladden your hearts with the joyful morning of your glory. Call us by your name of the great day of your coming, and give us grace to offer with all the host of heaven an ending praise to God in whom all things find their endings now and ever. Amen. And now what kind of is this?
we hear the instruction of God through the recitation of the ten words. God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. Lord, have mercy on us. Give us grace to keep this law. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Lord, have mercy on us. Give us grace to keep Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us. Give us grace to keep these laws and bring them to our hearts. The summary of the law from Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Our Lord Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets.
I baptize you with water, but someone who's coming soon, who is greater than I am, so much greater than I'm even worthy to be a slave and untie the straps of the sandals, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. He is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he will clean up the flesh threshing for gathering the wheat into fire, but burning the chaff with never any fire. John used many such warnings as he announced the good news to the people. One day, when the crowds were being baptized, Jesus himself was baptized. As he was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit in bodily form descended on him like a dove, and a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly son, and you bring me great joy. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise you, Lord Christ. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh. So, uh, 
Uh, so we think maybe, I would say a year, between a year and two years of age, it looks like, that they go to when they see the child. Who are the Magi? Well, the Magi's are astrologers slash astronomers. So in the ancient world, you don't make a distinction. Of course, we make a distinction today. But they're stargazers. And the next question is, who can be a stargazer? Well, it's the learned, the wise, the uh, well-to-do people of the day. Because if you're a farmer, you're not, even though you can look at the stars, you're not really looking at the stars because you need to be sleeping. Because in the morning, you're going to be up working. So the people who are going to have the ability to do this are going to be people who have the means to do it. So undoubtedly, they were prosperous of some kind, uh, an upper class, maybe distinctive. The other thing is they saw in the stars cosmic events that related to our lives. And that's where the astrology part comes in. So that's, as you know, the, the, I think they still have newspapers, they have horoscopes and those kinds of things. That's a continuation of just kind of what they did. But uh, they saw more things. And so uh, what happens is they, they're looking at the stars and maybe there's a, there's a couple of planets that come into line and one means uh, the kind of the area where Jerusalem is and another means a king is born or something. So that's a possibility that that occurred. But anyway, they're looking at it and they said, we've got to go to Jerusalem to acknowledge this king. Now, I think that's important. Acknowledge the king. They're not looking for God. So they're, they're, that's not in the, that's not in the offing. But they're going to go to Jerusalem to acknowledge the king. So they go to Jerusalem, and apparently they're of sufficient status that they get a hearing with King Herod. Um, now this is Herod the Great, and as I like to say, misnamed. Seems to be known as Herod the Monster. Herod the um, I just can't even think of how a term bad enough for him. He's a horrible human. The world would be better if he had never been born. That kind, he's really literally that kind of guy. He had his own uh, family slaughtered so that they couldn't inherit. It was just, it's just really awful, it's just an awful human. So he's called Herod the Great because he engaged in some building uh, campaigns. He's not really the king of the Jews. He's not even really a Jew. He's actually an Idumean, but he, somehow he gets a connection and it's kind of distant that brings him there. And so he becomes the king of the Jews, in part because he knows how to placate the Roman emperor. And it's, it's a good, I gotta say, he's shrewd. So he's on the wrong side in the fight that's going on among the people to be the emperor. But then he jumps onto the right side and everything's cool. So he, he does what he has to do. He acknowledges Herod. Or excuse me, uh, Caesar, and, and that's good enough. Okay. So he's he's the reigning monarch when Jesus is born, and dies shortly after Jesus is born. Although we don't know exactly how long. So <clears throat> they go to see Herod, and Herod listens and says, "You know what? This is great, uh, but we don't have anybody here that's born." So. Uh, the, they consult the, the leading biblical authorities, and they say, well, actually, the Messiah is probably going to be born in Bethlehem. Because after all, that's David's town, and we have this prophecy from Micah that looks like it might apply to it. So uh, you might want to go check out Bethlehem. And Herod says, good idea. And I'll tell you what, let me know when you find him. Because, you know, I would really like to acknowledge him as well. Yeah. And of course, as you're reading, as you already know, you already know that that isn't the way, right? That really Herod wants to do them in. So they go to Bethlehem, and sure enough, the star takes them to the house, and literally the house where Jesus is. So all our pictures of them going, you know, along with the shepherds and all that, that's all brought in. It's not, you know, doesn't really line up with the story. But anyway, so he's there. They're there, and they bring him uh, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So in Maribel this morning, the first hymn was, We Three Kings of Orient Are. And of course, the hymn's completely wrong. Uh, we, we don't know. They were kings. They were The one thing we know for sure is they're not kings. They're these magi. And these magi are not kings. Secondly, we don't know if there were three kings. Three people. Three magi. Because it's only 
by the three presents. It doesn't say in the text that there were three, but we said, well, there's three presents, each one brought a present. Maybe two brought three presents. Maybe four brought three presents. These presents are, and there's a lot made of them, so gold is for a king. This, this isn't him, by the way, but this is true. But this is a common interpretation. Gold is for a king. The frankincense acknowledges divinity as you offer incense, right? If you come before the deity, you offer incense. These are the prayers of the people going up. And then the myrrh is a burial spice. So I put all that together. Um, that's all right. I wouldn't push it too far. One of the problems, I, I just I should just tell you that we have to be careful with biblical imagery that we don't push it too far. It's fine. You know, it, it works, but it's, it may not be accurate. So if someone comes along and says, well, that was completely wrong, you can say, well, that's fine. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But uh, for sure, these are the kinds of gifts that would be offered to royalty. So that's what's being announced here. Now, what's really more interesting is, why did Matthew include this story in his gospel? Now, he's the only one. But in particular, Matthew. Matthew is the most Jewish gospel that we have. So Mark, you know, has one thing, and then Luke is more of a Gentile kind of thing. Why Matthew? Because the Magi were frowned upon by the Jews. This is not something that they really wanted to have anything a part of. In fact, one of the learned rabbis is accursed as the person who learns anything from a magi. So you go, hmm, what's going on here? Well, I think what's really interesting is that Matthew understands that the first revelation in his gospel to anybody about who this child is is to these people coming from the East who have no idea. Who, you know, couldn't, they don't know the Jewish scriptures. They, they didn't know even where he was to be born. But they're coming and they're acknowledging him as the Messiah before anybody. It reminds me a little bit of, of the Gospel of John, where it says, you know, the Word became flesh. And then he goes, the world did not know him, even though he created the world. He says, the world was made for him, but no, they didn't know him. He came to his own people. But his own people did not receive him. But to those who believed in his name, they become children of God, right? So it's open for everybody. So you have in this story literally the actual correlation with the Gospel of John. So in the darkness, they're looking up at the light. They see the stars. They come to Bethlehem, and they discover a king. Little they know. But even in the midst of that, the king as such, even though I wouldn't blame the Jews for King Herod by any stretch of the imagination, but even still, he's there, and that's not acknowledged. But to all who acknowledge even these awful magi, now they have the right to become children of God. So this revelation occurs. Now, by the way, so here you got Matthew 2, where the Gentile magi come, and that of Jesus the end of the Gospel of Matthew, no surprise, was it go into all nations. So you are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Making disciples of all nations. That was not in the cards. That was not supposed to, supposed to be the way. You know, you were supposed, the Messiah was to be the king of Israel, to be the king of the Jews. Now, it, there was the promise that all the nations would come and acknowledge that. And we see some of that taking place with these magi as well. And that's one of the reasons why, by the way, we think of them as kings. Because it says in the prophecies that the kings will come and acknowledge him. And bring him these gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Okay, so that's the revelation. Now, what we have there is a revelation of who this child is. Obviously, no ordinary child. Now we go to the, the baptism of Jesus. And that's the baptism of our Lord. So we have John the Baptist, this character. Um, I always like to say that uh, we would not want John over for Sunday dinner. Uh, first of all, he ate locusts and wild honey. I always want to say wild. It always seems to me to be like wild locusts. I don't know if you have like a trained locust. I mean, if you raise locusts, you have locusts and wild honey. Is this grand Nessus diet? 
you know, he's, he's dressed like a prophet would look, you know, and he's out in the wilderness and he's screaming at people, just like y'all like. And uh, he's not trying to win friends and influence people by any stretch of the imagination, but he's this prophet signing off in the wilderness. And so the Pharisees and the, same, the religious leaders come out to see him and he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? I love that. And then he says, and he's talking about the, the Messiah that's to come, he goes, his winnowing fork is in his hand, he's on the threshing floor gathering up the wheat, and he tossed the wheat up, and the wheat comes down, but the chaff gets blown away, and the rest goes into the unquenchable fire. And he says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And then Luke says, in those in just marvelous words, and with other words, John preached the good news. <laughs> Oh, if I need good news like that. But now think. So what he's doing is he's out in the wilderness. And people are going out to see him to get serious about religion, if you will. They're, they're serious. They want to they make a commitment. And their baptism is for the uh, uh, repentance, for the forgiveness of sins. It's a little different than what we understand. So in Judaism, the incorporating right, R-I-T-E, the incorporating right is circumcision. For women, there's kind of a purification, there's a, it's kind of a cleansing like a baptism kind of thing. So baptism is a part of their religious observance, but it's not all encompassing. So now John is taking that cleansing and using it as a, as a commitment ceremony. He said, basically saying, you come out here, you're going to get serious about religion, and as a sign of that, you're going to be baptized. You're going to be purified in order for your, to come out as you come up to go forth with this new resolve, this new, if you will, New Year's resolution to go and be faithful. And now Jesus appears on the scene. And we don't know a lot about Jesus' life from, let's say, age 2 to 30. Just that one incident in the temple. We know some things. We know that he went to the uh, synagogue as was his custom. We know that he was raised and a religiously observant home. They did everything you were supposed to do. They, they went to the temple at Passover. They dedicated Jesus at the temple on the eighth day. They had him circumcised and went through the purification rites. He's doing this stuff. It appears that we just kind of go backwards, but he's acknowledged as a rabbi of his day. So that when he goes to the temple, and this would be, by the way, in Luke 4, not the temple, the synagogue, um, he's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah for him to read and expound. That's what a learned rabbi would do. So probably in his life, as he's going up, he maybe he studied under a rabbi. Maybe he was didactic, self-taught, self right? Autodidactic, self-taught, but something, right? But he has this, and clearly understands and knows. So there's that. He also, we know, engaged in a trade, very common. Uh, probably was a stonemason, not a wood carpenter. Uh, they didn't have wood like. So when the King James Version of the Bible was being translated, they looked around and they saw a bunch of timber. They said, obviously, he was a carpenter. Like when you think of a wood carpenter, it's not the, it's not the environment in first century uh, Galilee. So he's probably a stonemason, like his father. Don't, we don't know that for sure. But then he begins his ministry at age 30. OK. So now he comes. And I think, we don't know the relationship between John and Jesus, how close it was. Because there's some indication that he, they weren't really aware, I mean, that John wasn't really aware of Jesus. We know that they're related, but, okay, I'm just going to say, you Dutch people understand this. You might have a cousin that you don't even know about that's floating around, because there's so many of them, right? And so that, that's where I really picked up on it. So he might, this is a close community, they live apart, he, he may not really have known a very, or John might not have known that Jesus was his cousin. Whatever. But he does know one thing. When Jesus shows up on the scene, he goes, okay, I know about these other people that come to be baptized, but here's a case where, as it says in the Gospel of Matthew, this is out of order. I should be baptized by you. Not you, by me. I can see that. That's clear. I know enough to know that you're on board. This isn't really necessary. Jesus says, well, I need to do this in order to fulfill all righteousness. 
In other words, I need to do this because this is what it, and I want to identify with what you're doing here, John. I want to be a part of this movement. And if that's going to be the case, I can't be above it. I got to be in it. Just like he is with everything. He's got to be in it. And so he is. And then, as the Gospels point out, he goes into the, he's baptized. John, Luke says he's praying. Luke always indicates this wonderful relationship between the Father and Jesus and praying. And so now he goes into the water and as he comes up, the dove from heaven comes down and says, you hear the divine voice. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. The divine commission, the divine recognition. So it's one thing for the Magi to come and acknowledge the king. It's another thing for the Father to acknowledge the Son. This is my Son, whom I love. With Him I am well pleased. Now, to show you this works. Uh, we'll obviously get into it later, but so now Jesus, from the divine commission, the divine recognition, goes into the wilderness to face Satan, the great tempter. And he overcomes the temptations with the endorsement of God on his back. With the divine recognition, you are my son, he faces Satan and now wins the battle. One of the things I like to say about the temptations is I, you know, I've watched sports enough to know I can watch a game and sometimes I can figure out even when the game's close who's going to win the game. Because the team that's going to win has everything going its way. It, the other team just can't stop me. They have to stop. It's just going to be a matter of time. The only thing that has to do is be played out and then the victory will be secure. And I always look at that as a temptation. So Jesus overcame the tempter and as he left, it seemed to be a draw. Jesus didn't succumb to the temptation, but you know there was going to be another day. But the victory was won because he didn't succumb. So then the next time we hear the divine voice like that, it's on the Mount of Transfiguration. Interestingly enough, the end of Epiphany, the last Sunday of Epiphany, just before Lent, for Ash Wednesday, is called Trans it's always Transfiguration Sunday. No matter how many Sundays there are in Epiphany, it's always the last one. <clears throat> and there Jesus goes up onto the mount, and again he hears the divine voice. This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So that's an additional little phrase. And Jesus comes down from the mountain. And he doesn't go, oh, good, yay, yay, I'm, I'm all in now, whatever. He said, takes his face and he sets it to Jerusalem, where he's going to suffer and die. The divine recognition sends him on mission to face the tempter, to face the cross. And each time he succeeds, because he has the endorsement, the recognition of the Father. So this day becomes so important because it's not just a day about baptism, it's about, a, it's about a day of salvation. It's in this event that we start to see how God is going to finally solve the problem of sin. And when we're baptized, we're baptized into that very same experience. The divine recognition that we are claimed by God we are called by God and we're empowered by God to go forth in ministry and service in Christ's name. Now, obviously, that's not going to be exactly the same. <laughs> but nevertheless, we do so in Christ's name, with Christ's power, with Christ's life uh, within us. And so this day becomes a great day uh, as a revelation of who Jesus is and actually of who we are in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for the way you have graced our lives with your presence and your life and your life-giving spirit. Empower us to live as your people, just as Christ was empowered by your spirit to uh, his uh, perfect way of observance and faithfulness and commitment and service. May we share in that life. And may we be called and serve as Christ's own. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.
Drink it as often as you shall drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, let us proclaim the great mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Remembering your goodness and grace, we offer ourselves to you with gratitude as we share this joyful feast. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this bread and cup. Make us one in the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord. We shape our lives by your living word and renew our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may follow you more faithfully. Through the Lord Jesus Christ and the unity of the Holy Spirit, we bless you, our Father, the God of glory, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Christ has taught us to pray, so we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, broken for you. Take and eat. Remember that Christ died for you. The blood of Christ, the cup, uh, the cup of salvation, take and drink in remembrance that Christ died for you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. give you thanks and praise, O oh God, that you have fed us with your mercy and poured out your spirit in this place. Continue to nourish and fill us each day, that we may live as your beloved people. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Um, let me just say a word about this. Him is uh, one of my favorites. I always like to have the baptism, so I thought it would be appropriate. Again, it just goes through kind of, you'll see, the whole life that unfolds. Um, and with the with the knowledge that we put that Let's stand and sing it again.
keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always, both now and forevermore. Amen.